Hello, and thanks for joining us. I am Obiora Ilo. Well, today on our program, we'll be featuring a very distinguished Nigerian. I'm also there to say that he's a controversial Nigerian. I will also go further to say that he has held very controversial positions in the country. And um, one of the parts he played years ago is still controversial even today. My pleasure to introduce a very distinguished academic and political scientist, Professor Humphrey Musu. Prof, you're welcome to our program. Thank you, Obiara. Good to see you. It's a pleasure, <laughs> once more. <laughs> Seeing you looking so healthy, looking very strong, what's the magic? Well, um, 21 years after I left office, I had time to myself to do what I like to do, uh, take care of my health, exercise when it is necessary, and help my community in any way my services would be required. And that gives me special joy. I mean, it's unbelievable that it's almost 21 years since you left the uh, National Electoral Commission. Uh, and after the controversial June uh, 12 elections, how have you kept busy? What has taken your time all these 21 years? You know, after all the emotions and passions about the result of well-conducted election on June 12, 1993, I had settled down to put my thoughts on all the events and the processes that led to that election. You would agree with me that the logistics for that election were properly put in place. And uh, the election was acknowledged by both national and international observers to be credible, free, and fair. So I have put all the events, processes that led to the conduct of the election, what happened before the election, what happened during the election, what happened during the announcement of the results, and of course, the annulment that was most unexpected. Okay. Uh, perhaps that's why you called it controversial, because well, there was really nothing. Controversial, except <laughs> the outcome. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the, the, the annulment. The annulment, actually. Oh, yeah, the annulment. Yes. I, I know that a lot of people watching us now will want to hear some of the things you put down, what happened before and after. But I want to take this story to the beginning. Yes. Um, you were born in 1941. Yes. 2nd of October, to be precise. Yes. Um, tell me about growing up. You know, tell me about your early life. Did you think at that tender age, maybe in the first five, ten years of your life, that you were going to be a man people would see at the airport and, oh, that's Humphrey, 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 Humphrey. <laughs> so tell me about, about the beginning. Yeah, I was born in a village setting, mm -hmm. Ajale, now in Orumba North local government area. My father was uh, the traditional ruler of Ajali community. And he was ruling Ajali from 1920 to 1978. I attended the government school, Ajali, for two years, between 1948 and 1949. Mm -hmm. I left my parents and lived in this city, Enugu, from 1950 to 1952. I attended St. Michael's Construction School, Catholic School, for three years. 
I moved with my brother to Abakliki in 1952. Mm -hmm. I finished my primary education at Presbyterian Primary School Abakliki in 1955. In fact, we were the first set of Eastern Nigerians to take the then government first school living certificate. Before then, each mission, Catholic mission, Anglican mission, held its own examination. In that year, the Honorable Minister of Education for Eastern Nigeria organized for all the Eastern Nigerians in Standard 6 first school living a certificate examination. Well, uh, that was the first mark about what could happen to me in future. Mm -hmm. I excelled and had distinction. Uh, from that, I went to McGregor College, Afikbo. Now in a, Afikbo is in a, uh, a Bonny State, Bonny State. <laughs> yes, a Bonny State, you know. So from McGregor College, I studied at home. I took Wuzi College uh, correspondence courses. And in 1962, I cleared six O-level papers at a sitting. How did you fit that? In 1963, just six months after, I cleared three papers at A level at a sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, I gained admission to University of Nigeria in 1963. Between 63 and 66, I was at University of Nigeria reading political science. Mm -hmm. I was the second best graduating student for the year 1966. I had first class honors in political science and uh, was employed immediately by Share BP in Port Harcourt before the Nigerian Civil War, July 6, 1966. That was my university education. So what, when the war started, uh, on which part of the divide were you? Of course, I was in Biafra. <laughs> I couldn't have been anywhere. Share BP, what was left of Share BP, was turned into what was then called Petroleum Management Board for Biafra. Mm -hmm. So I was staff of PMB between 1967 to 68. I think to the end of the war, uh, our task is to produce, distribute uh, petroleum products. You know, in Biafra, indigenous technology was applied in refining of pro uh, petroleum products. Mm -hmm. So I was a staff of PNB throughout the Civil War. Of course, we were moving from one place to another, from Port Harcourt to Mahia and finally ended in my village in charge of the four directorate there. <laughs> in Ajali. Ajali. You know. yeah. That's where I was when the war ended, January 1970. So when the war ended, did you continue with Shell BP? No. When the war ended, it was difficult because the oil had been politicized. The oil was a major factor that led to the war. Who controls what? Share BP had moved its headquarters from Port Harcourt to Lagos. And most of its Eastern Nigerian staffs, especially Igbos, were, well, they, we were told to wait. <laughs> that was a gentle word to say you've been terminated. Mm -hmm. With that, I had to, again, look for an offer that was made to me in 1966 with first-class honors. I was offered 
assistant lecturership at UNN. And if I had scholarship, I would have been away from the country if I had accepted that offer before the Civil War. With no work, I went back to University of Nigeria. And uh, fortunately, I was hired as assistant lecturer in 1970, October. I taught for two years, 1970s, 71, 71, 72, and won agri-fellowship to United States. I also won Commonwealth Scholarship to London School of Economics and Political Science. I had a choice. Is it to go to Britain, the prestigious London School of Economics and Political Science, or go to United States, University of California, Berkeley. It was quite a choice for me, but knowing United States uh, as a superpower, <laughs> then an advance it had made in social studies, I decided to go to United States. That's where I did my graduate work between 1972 and 76. In 1976, I had my PhD in political science and returned back to UNN as a senior lecturer. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so um, when you returned to UNN, you were there till um, 1989? Yes. When I came back to UNN, of course, I engaged uh, with other colleagues in series of research. I was involved. You could recall it was in 1979 that Nigeria changed to presidential system of government. Yes. So uh, some of us who studied in the United States, quite a number of us, were gathered by federal government to tour the country and educate Nigerians the implications, the processes of presidential system of government. That was uh, 1979, before uh, the presidential system. Yes, yes. I was also involved with the former uh, Sultan of Sokoto, there was ministerial conference on local government reform in Nigeria, 1976. Mm -hmm. So we produced a report that reorganized the local government system as a third tier of government. Of government. Was it the one you chaired? Was it the one that was on the Federal Technical Committee? That's a different one. After that, um, I was appointed uh, with some other colleagues you know, to advise the government on how to apply civil service reform to local government service. That was the, the one that we recommended that local government on its own should be a third tier system of government, autonomous, should receive its own funding directly from federal government, get from the state, generate its own revenue, and giving specific responsibilities without interference from the state government. That was uh, 1989. Yes, before my appointment as next chairman. Before your appointment as next chairman, at the point you worked under uh, Samson Emeko Mera, yes, who was then a military administrator of Old Anambra State. Yes. How did that happen? Well, uh, I headed 
Department of Political Science for quite a couple of years, served as Associate Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences. Within this period, a Mekomeroa Komodo, a Komodo, was then serving as Minister of Information under Buhari administration. We invited him, I, as head of political science, to give lecture on his ministry and how we could be of assistance because they were training information officers abroad. Mm -hmm. So he came and after the lecture, we had a close room discussion about what we can do to assist in training information officers and those in charge, you know, under Buhari, there was the program war against indiscipline, indiscipline yeah. uh -huh, how we could assist. So when he got back to Lagos, there was this coup. <laughs> he survived and was posted as governor, military governor of Old Anambra State. When he arrived, he sent, looking for me, I've never known him before, Outside the account. Outside, uh, having invited him, come, how do we do business with you? How can we help you train information officers? I, I thought he had, he was a bit academic in his approach to administration. He liked dealing with academicians who have practical experience and so on. So he invited me, and uh, because we have been involved in local government research with Dasuki, uh, Ascon, he appointed a committee and made me head how to improve the local government services in Anambra State, how really to get close to the people, uh, ensure rural development, and so on. So we prepared a paper, a position paper, about how this could be done. You know in this part of the land, often there is land dispute between communities because the, we don't have a lot of land mass. There was also conflict between traditional rulers and town unions. So this was the basis of our research. How to, because you can't really accelerate development where you have conflict. So our concern then was, how do you minimize conflict? How do you ensure cooperation between town union and traditional institutions? That he, he was interested in this kind of approach. So I presided over a workshop that recommended a position paper about how this could be done and accelerate the process of rural development in old Anambra State. When he asked me to do this, he also asked some other people to do. <laughs> I mean, uh, invited, uh, wanted the best. I think he asked three different Group. groups to do this. In the end, he found that my own uh, appeared more practical how to ensure that you have peace, settle conflict, even get to the process of writing town union constitutions, if it's necessary, create a position for the president of town union. How would town union president relate with the traditional institution, the uh, Igwe's cabinet? Possibly, could you co-opt the president into Igwe's cabinet and then ensure peace. So when we did this, after two, three months, he dissolved the cabinet he inherited from the former military admin, uh, governor, Madweke. And suddenly, you know, during military uh, regimes, <laughs> appointments were offered allowance over the air. I heard over the air that I have been made commissioner for local government, rural development, and chieftaincy matters. 
uh, a position I held between 1986 and 1988, um, between a short period also Commissioner for Agriculture. So that's how I got involved in the administration of local government system in Old Anambra State. Of course, we left, tried to do something that attracted even federal government uh, into our state. Whoever then was visiting Anambra, whether uh, the chief of army staff, Abacha, or the president, or Ekomo, I would not only explain to an August visitor what we are doing, I would take them into the field. A lot was done uh, by the old Anambrian, uh, uh, people of uh, uh, Anambra State, mm -hmm. by mobilizing them to work in partnership with government because we enunciated their policy. Government cannot do everything by itself. What do you do to assist? So this attracted a lot of interest in rural development, rural road construction, water supply, agriculture, and so on. So, and most importantly, settlement of disputes out of court, local disputes between traditional rulers and town unions, intra and inter-community disputes between various communities. We set a lot of peace panel all over old Anambra State. Uh, typically, the uh, Atani, uh, Enugu Agede, Abagana, quite Umunze. They were places that had cases in court for over 80 years, 90 years. There have been destructions of life and property. Most of these cases through peace panel were settled out of court and peace returned. And when peace returned, we tried to in initiate rural development. It could be agriculture, it could be road, it could be rural electrification. This attracted a lot of int interest from the center and all over the country. So that was the old Anambra between 1986 and 1988, a lot was done. In 1988, you left office as commissioner? Yes. Did you go back to UNN? As soon as Emeroa uh, was reassigned, a new governor, the then Conor Konobi, took office. Um, of course, Every governor is entitled to having his own men. So in 1988, the first step of sending us out of his administration was to reshuffle his cabinet. He sent me to Ministry of Agriculture. Well, that's a place, I think, the salvation of this country. If we were to make a major step, not only now, but in future, if we harness all the potentialities in the agriculture. Because within the short period, six, seven months I was there, I left a little landmark about what could be done. Because I used to wonder, what do they really do in Ministry of Agriculture? But I recall that during Okpara's era, that a lot was done in terms of farm plantations, farm settlements all over. So the first thing I did when I got into the ministry was to study the past, the files, and uh, there were some remnants of people who served under Okpara, Menekaya, uh, quite a number of them, the owner of Zodiac Hotel, P O K K is now late. I gathered all these people. I said, tell me how we can revive 
food production, what we can do, encourage school agriculture, primary school agriculture, large-scale agriculture, commercial agriculture, and then there is so much involved in agriculture, like fishery, irrigation, forestry, and I discovered each was on its own, that I felt that if all cooperate, that if people know the outcome of the research in the forestry, the improved crops, then uh, those who engage in agri-extension could benefit. So that interested me most, and we really launched a major program, War Against Hunger, mobilizing all these experts from irrigation unit, from agri-extension, from fishery, from improved soil, and uh, within, we informed the local government, we will carry fertilizer, uh, get to a local government. Uh, people will turn up in thousands. You wouldn't believe it. The only thing that was happening in those days, if you want fertilizer, you get it. It's not you will get. You fertilize, up. for instance, there are different kinds of fertilizer for different crops. In the past, what I inherited, you could, people who need dead fertilizer in a area for rice may get fertilizer for yam. So, but with that kind of program, we got into the field with everything. So whoever wants improved seed, you get it. Improved okwa, this thing, you get it. Palm for palm, you get it. That was ongoing. And the policy then is to replace all the old palm trees yeah. with uh, improved uh, palm trees with greater yield. This was succeeding. It was catching up. I would discuss agriculture in TV, as, uh, you know, radio everywhere. And, and, uh, yes, and suddenly the cabinet was dissolved. And so I left, went back to school to teach that in Soka. I was reappointed uh, head of political science and the coordinator of local government training program. That was the position I was holding 89 when again over the national news, I was appointed chairman, National Electoral Commission, 89. February 28. When television was invented, it was not only to entertain, but to tell stories of heroes on the pains of the weak. To reveal the big secrets and report the little things that matter. To unveil the complex issues and bring reports of events and personalities that shape our lives. Open your mind to true television with Frontline. Hot, incisive, in-depth, straight to the point, front line, wherever the news is. You know your mentor, um, Emma Awa, yes. was occupying that position and, and had just resigned, had just left the office over a disagreement with the president at that time. Did, did, did that not worry you when you were taking up your position? I wasn't pretty sure that uh, that he resigned or there were, uh, I was uh, surprised when the commission was dissolved. Okay. The commission, the entire commission was dissolved and restructured and least did I expect that I would replace my teacher as a professor. Again, I wasn't consulted. No one gave me a hint. I wasn't, because with the stint I had as commissioner for local government, commissioner for agriculture, I thought that was enough. But suddenly, well, with the ASCON appointment uh, about local government reform and all the application of civil service rule to local government service, 
I settled back to my teaching uh, appointment, and which I really enjoyed. So suddenly, February 28, 1989, I heard that uh, I had been appointed to replace my former teacher. You know, uh, and we really related very well. Mm -hmm. And I referred as teacher, uh, uh, people, and later colleague at the same university. Uh, we had excellent relationship. So when I was appointed, I, I was living here, in the little bungalow, and uh, covering my teaching duties from here to Nsuka. I was just returning to hear this over the radio. And uh, I could remember the first media representative uh, to just follow and begin to ask questions was Guardian, Guardian representative, who asked, uh, why are you replacing your teacher? What do you think you can do better than our? I said, just if what I heard over the radio is true, well, and uh, if it indeed is true, well, we owe a duty to serve this country, to give this country the best service possible as a nation, that if it is the wish of God for me to do this, and the nation through the president had confidence that I would do everything in me to make sure that elections were well conducted. And uh, to buttress this point, because election duties in this country is a very challenging at any point in time, no matter the circumstances and the timing and where and the political situation that you find yourself all contribute to making you how you will do that job. So when before we were inaugurated, we were called uh, to say that, well, you are a political scientist. Because I didn't know the reason why I was appointed. I wanted to know what motivated, because I felt uh, that our, my teacher was experienced he must have been doing excellent work, but it's on the quiet side. He said, well, we've restructured this commission that was coming through the vice president, Aikomo. Don't give us any opportunity to do this again. We want you to run a vibrant electoral commission, a credible commission. We want you to institutionalize it to be a credible commission with life of its own. And you, as a political scientist, you would have been aware of what happened during our first republic, how people had lost confidence in the electoral process, in the ballot box, the truth of the matter, then as I was being uh, being reminded by the then Vice President, Aikomo, that people had lost confidence in the electoral box, in the ballot box system. You should restore that confidence. Use your ingenuity, use your experience, use whatever. You are a Nigerian. Make something indigenous that can help us, help this nation have confidence in the ballot box. So that was uh, perhaps th they might have thought that I could do it having had practical experience in local government administration, in local government reform. They might have thought perhaps my experience as commissioner for local government dealing with different kinds of people traditional rulers, town unions, might have qualified me to deal with the complex situation. Sometimes you have to deal with politicians, different orientation, and people who will want to win at all costs. 
So they felt that you have credibility to do this. So perhaps uh, they wanted also somebody who should relate with the press, explain what you are doing at any time so that you carry the people, explain to government, explain to Nigerian public, explain to press, uh, and we try to do all that. What were the first steps you took when you got to Nekon? Yes, that's very important. Restoration of confidence and creating a commission that we have self-confidence in itself. I assembled, I asked for a number of people to enable me to do this difficult task. First, I got Tony Reddy, who later on became the MD uh, NTA as my image maker. And that uh, I told him we would go all out to newspapers, editorial boards, to explain whatever program, whatever reform we introduced. Like when we introduced the open ballot, you know what people say it was primitive and all that, that we had a duty to, because there was no need to have a program and people don't understand it, the aim behind it and why you are doing it. Like when we introduced open ballot, the, we wanted people to key behind those they wanted to vote for because we want people to I mark that whoever they voted for is who will be the person announced to be the winner. This was a way of restoring confidence in the electoral process, you know. And it, it, it got on. So first, the loyalty of the staff to build a commission, I assembled a team and make sure that they were well taken care of. Like when we moved to Abuja, you know, Abuja is not uh, friendly in terms of junior staff, mm -hmm. accommodation and all that. Before ever we left Lagos to Abuja, I made sure that in Kubwa, I bought over uh, 300 two-bedroom bungalows for my junior staff. I'm sure they will never forget because they own them today, you know. So uh, for somebody, if you are expecting somebody to be fully committed, fully loyal to whatever he's doing, he must be sure when he sleeps at the end of the day. Not only that I got this, I furnished it, I bought buses, and uh, people still remember me for this. Not only that, NASCO was the then FCT minister. There were a number of abandoned FEDECO, uh, no, uh, yes, FEDECO building, which I completed, a number of abandoned flats, blocks of flats, uncompleted. There were about 14, each 16 three-bedroom flats. I completed them for the intermediate uh, staff, uh, senior staff, you know. <coughs> And I understand uh, since Obasanjo's uh, privatization or monetization of accommodation, each of staff who live in this three bedroom flat, that each of them is worth 25 or 30 million and they own them. So loyalty to the commission. Through incentives. Yeah, as incentive. I also met National Electoral Commission to be a pensionable organization. Before then, ad hoc staff were recruited, were uh, selected from state, federal, and this was how it was done. In all the elections, even during Eswa, Ani, Ovia Whiskey, mm -hmm. they brought temporary staff. After election, they go back to their respective uh, states or federal ministries. I said, no, if you have to have an uh, electoral management body that will be efficient, that should be committed to its duty, you should have a pensionable body with its own staff, its own welfare scheme, and they know they are working, 
when the politicians like national commissioners and resident electoral commissioners are terminated, the core staff that conduct election will be there so that they carry research, they assemble data and all that. We did that. We also uh, uh, convinced, because it wasn't easy to make organization that was ad hoc organization, uh, pensionable organization. Uh, that's, again, uh, what the then head of state, the president, I explained to him the need for this. This was achieved uh, through decree. Yeah. <laughs> and that's still many people who worked for the INEC today. They retire. They retire with their benefits. How do you work for an organization where, when you don't know at the end of it all uh, what will happen to you? So at least after conduct of each election, if political appointees are sacked, the permanent staff will be there. So that was the immediate. Not only that, I also acquired land in Abuja. The neck building, the headquarters, the present headquarters was built by me with only 54 million, six-story building. Not funded is money I saved from election. I asked permission from government. Could I use this to have, uh, because they were talking of computerization, I said that it was still futuristic. What we need is a permanent headquarters. So that headquarters was done. As I was doing for the headquarters, I was also doing this at state and local government level, creating sense of belonging, sense of mission to staff at national headquarters state headquarters and local government headquarters. Let's talk about the, the, the hallmarks of, of your tenure. Yeah. Open ballot, um, uh, option A4. Yes. How did, you, how did you and your colleagues come to this conclusion that this was what was going to give the country a credible election? You know, I did tell you that when we were inaugurated March 7, uh, 1990, we were reminded, do the best for this nation. In fact, we were even promised national honors. If what you do is generally accepted by Nigerians, because in elect elections that are not accepted by generality of Nigerians are not credible. Generality of Nigerians must accept the outcome because this is the, my internal philosophy that as a boss of an electoral management body, first, you must have that the first major constituency in your heart, mind, and soul is generality of Nigerians. Would they accept the outcome of the election? If generality of Nigerians say that it's not credible, then it's not credible. So the focus. Two, the staff you work with, you must carry them along. It's not one man affair because you cannot be all over the place. There is always logistic preparation. And if you fail in logistics, you have failed. And part of the problem of elections in this country is logistic failure. Either the uh, voter register is not, uh, it's not credible, or uh, you have two or three uh, competing voter registers at the same time, that's wrong. Three, if sensitive electoral materials are not moved to places that are needed at the same time all over the country, they, you know, they, these are some of the logistics that things later on I will explain, we did to make sure that in those difficult terrains all over Nigeria, that sensitive electoral materials were taken to them by eight or nine without storytelling. You know, so uh, the, being a political scientist, and having been a Nigerian and knowing what happened with 1964 federal government election, 
the revolt all over the place. Knowing what happened with October 1965, regional election in the West within Akintola, and burning of houses, and knowing again in 1983, the second return of Shagari, that after the uh, election I inaugurated, there was violence all over. It gave me a lot of thoughts, a lot of things. You know, I called my national commissioners, we should now think, first and foremost, how do we carry Nigerians? How do we ensure, starting with local government election, that what we would do would be accepted by the people? And this is this internal research. Leave the Western mode mm -hmm. secret. But you know, it is ideal where everything is perfect, where people already know that they will not engage in double voting, they will not pour acid in anything, they will just enter a polling station, do their civic duty. Yeah, it is so in old democracies, but it's not so in third world, where people want to win at all costs. So knowing that the confidence of Nigerians had been shattered with all those elections I mentioned, we needed something, Nigerian, Something not exactly Western. Indigenous. <laughs> Indigenous. Homegrown. <laughs> <laughs> Something that we make people, yeah, you people are trying. You can improve on this. This is something. Uh, and so uh, we came out with this open ballot. Uh, we experimented, especially with local government election December 8, 1990. The first people should key along the candidates there, you know, because it's not national election now. We experiment with it, and the people should watch the counting, you know, the slang then, no mago mago, yeah. and, you know, no one, one, two. one, two, and, and the electorate uh, enjoy the counting. <laughs> and we say, wait, and know the result. Before so, you oh, before you go home. So we did it. And uh, it worked, I mean, for local government election. And all the people who came out, who participated, were satisfied that the efforts were not in vain. Tell me, when the first time you went to the president, yes. or the head of state then, yes. and said, we want to do open ballot, yes. how did they react? Initially, they, they were afraid. <laughs> they said, do you think, would this not lead to general confusion? I said, no. We start with local government and improve on it. He said, okay, but I said, that's why you appointed me. You said, look at something that will work. And, this is, what uh, and this is what I'm coming up with. And this is where I commend him because he had confidence. Because if it had failed, it would be his own program failing, you know. So we tried it and it worked. And you know, People in subsequent election, people were, we, you know what we call accreditation. Mm -hmm. That means before anything is done at all. All the people who were supposed to vote in a particular election would all be expected to be accredited, usually between 8 and 10 in the morning. In the morning. And if you don't, you know, that's where the elites criticize it. They say, ah, ah, why do you expect me to leave my office and come and wait for two hours? But for something that will be credible, acceptable, something that you will not manipulate, it was necessary to make that sacrifice, especially with uh, local government elections. So people appeared, accreditation done, so that, and the requirement it would be in this particular polling station, the number of voters in the register is 400. But the number of people accredited, there's no way you have the, uh, the same 400, mm -hmm. maybe 300 or yeah. 250. Everyone knows that. And you now say 250 will be participating in this election. And then they queue up either with the person or the posters of the uh, person. Thereafter, 
the counting is done. And the result, the council, especially the Wuhan, people held it, they enjoyed it. It was popular all over Nigeria. But for the elites, people criticized. We were a learning organization. Any organization must be a learning organization to know if there are faults, things you can amend and so on. So, sharpen yeah, sharpen, yeah. So, having done that, that's pure open ballot system. Then, MOPS, modified open balloting system, means you still have the accreditation. You, and I think the president and almost all the people that had taken the commission, managed the commission since I left office. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Dagogo Jack, Tayo uh, Akbata, Gobadia, Iwo, to President Jaga, they are still using accreditation yeah. as I introduced it. They will accredit. Secondly, after accreditation in a modified open balloting system. You announce this is the number of people, but whether they do it now, I don't know. Especially when they quarrel with the voters register in recent Anambra, this I don't know. But there should be a credible voters register. For all of this for to all work. For all of this to work. It is important. The first major step in having credible election, I should remind all Nigerians for 2015, is that the register must be credible. Especially when the National Assembly is pouring a lot of money. I use 42 million naira to conduct voters' register of May 1993 before June 12th election. Because government told me we don't have money. But the law requires before a major election, you have to have a revived voters' register. I did it, and it was credible. In any case, uh, after the accreditation and announcement, the number of people accredited, you have ballot paper. And I tried much later, even in improvement, the ballot paper of each local government may differ in color so that you don't shift uh, ballot paper men from one local government to another. In any case, you issue ballot paper. You go into closed let and vote secret, vote mark but you come out in the open, in the same box, so that there are not two separate boxes. If you put two separate boxes, one may be fake, knowing Nigeria. One may be destroyed. But if you put all the votes, and during counting, voters are encouraged not to go away. I don't know what happened now, whether they are encouraged to stay there. They count, and everyone will know the result that A, or B or C has won in that particular polling distinct. Before the collation process, and copies are given to the press, given you know, uh, to the polling agent, to security, for onward collation at each level. And this is how I think they still adopt elements of this. Mm -hmm.